flourish, to live to your highest purpose, not just to survive, but to thrive. God wants it for you even more than you want it for yourself. The Bible tells you that you're broken, but you're not abandoned like a junk car. It tells you that you have infinite worth because you bear the image of God. And Jesus doesn't just provide a vision for you to pursue, he does more. You see, Jesus provides the heart cure and renewal in your soul that enables you to actually pursue and experience flourishing. Because all of us are broken, we can be honest. Because all of us bear God's image, we can be hope-filled. You live in a broken world with a divine blueprint and a heavenly trajectory that is yours through faith in Christ. Yes, you're broken, but you have this divine blueprint and a glorious future that belongs to you through faith in Christ. Jesus gives you a new identity. He gives you a new sense of belonging and he gives you a new purpose. Jesus Christ said, I came that you might have life and have life abundantly. Well, good morning, church. How are you guys doing? Uh, it's good to see your faces. It's good to see your faces this morning. Um, I'm excited to preach this morning. We're going through the series Flourish. And um, this morning, we're going to be talking about probably the furthest thing that we think of when we think of flourishing. We're going to be talking about suffering. Suffering. How do we flourish while we go through suffering? Now, I know we haven't seen each other in a while, um, so this might come at a, as, as a surprise to you, but um, I'm getting old. I turned 36 the other day. Some of you are like, that's young. Uh, well, no, it's old. In young adult circles, I'm old. In fact, as we were worshiping 10,000 reasons, I raised my hand and something clicked. So <laughs> I am now in that group of people. I don't know what's next. White New Balance sneakers, I don't know, Lord. <laughs> Lord, please not that. Um, <laughs> but you know what? No matter what you do, uh, if you're wearing them, I'm sorry. And if you're new especially, I'm really sorry. You look cool. I think you're cool. But, um, but the reality is, you know, from the day that we're born, you know, we start to experience this de decay. We, we know that there's something happening in us. And as you get older, you start to realize that as you grow, you are starting to decay. And there's something that's broken, something that's off, and, and we don't have to look too far. We just have to look at ourselves, and we can see it clearly. The passage of Scripture that we're reading this morning is going to talk about that. It's going to talk about the brokenness, but I love that, that we have this heavenly trajectory. I love that video, because it says, yes, we're broken, but we have this greater hope, that this is not it. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be reading from, from verse 18. It says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we have a hope that is beyond this world. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us that hope through Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray this morning, Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would lead us, Lord. Open our eyes to see, Lord, the perfect plan that you have over the present sufferings that we go through. Lord, we want to live to glorify you. 
We want to live in eager expectation of being in your glory, Lord, in your presence. So I pray, Lord, that we would experience this in our lives, that we be submitted to you, Lord, and that we would ask you to lead us, Lord. I pray that you would speak this morning. Speak to my heart, speak to our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' mighty <coughs> name, amen. Amen. Well, I have three things uh, from this passage uh, that, that, that are connected to suffering that I want to share with you guys. And those three things are pretty simple. It says that the present is broken, that our future is glorious, and what we, we ought to do in the meantime. That the present is broken. And, 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 and I, I think for most of us, I don't know if this is your story, but I know it's, it's in a lot of people's stories, a lot of people's testimonies. If you're, if you're new to church, if you're just coming in here investigating what Christianity is about, what following Jesus is about, you probably come in with a little bit of a sense of this, a sense that if you come to Jesus, this is a lie that I believed before I was a Christian in my early days as a, as a follower of Jesus Christ, is that if you come to Jesus, everything will be okay. Everything in this life is going to be okay from the moment you give yourself to Jesus, give your life to Jesus, and he's going to make everything good. That when, when they said, hey, with every head bowed and every eye closed, raise your hands, yes, I see that hand, amen, come to the front. And when you go home, you're going to get a phone call from a guy who says, hey, listen, I heard you have like $10,000 dead. Guess what? It's done. I paid for it. Or that you go home and all of a sudden that thing that you were suffering with is gone or that sin that you were wrestling with is gone. But that wasn't true. And you know what? As I look at the word of God and as we look at even the verse that comes before verse 17, it says that we are going to suffer because of our proximity to Jesus Christ, not because we're far from him. It says that we as, as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, that our suffering I was suffering the persecution that we go through in, in, in this case that the, the Bible is saying that you're going to go through some stuff, not because you're bad, but because you're close to Jesus. That the Bible doesn't hide that. It is not in the fine print. It is not in the fast-forwarded words like in a drug commercial. The Bible says, hey, you're going to go through some stuff. The Bible... It, the Bible is awesome because there's two chapters where everything's perfect. Genesis 1 and 2. Get to verse 3, it's gone. Chapter 3, gone. From chapter 3 on, gone. People are suffering, people are in slavery, people are in bondage, people are running away, people are, are prophets are getting, running around naked. It's like, what? <laughs> it's like suffering because of your proximity to Jesus. Job didn't suffer because he was unfaithful. He suffered because he was faithful. But that's not how we package this sometimes. And so we find that in order for us to suffer well, to go through difficult times, to not, to, because this is what makes us, as followers of Jesus, people who can suffer well and go through things well, is that we have an eternal perspective. That is what helps us go through this life. That is what helps us go through the difficulties in this life. And the Bible doesn't minimize our suffering. No, it says that we have a Savior who suffered for us to flourish. So sometimes we can see that the picture that we have behind me, this, this object of, 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 um, of, of suffering that is behind us is actually the same image of our liberation and our flourishing. Wow. That through Jesus' pain that we find life. Wow. And so it is with you. But we see this, that the prison is broken. And when we look at this passage of Scripture Church, we find that, that Paul is comparing two things. He's saying, I consider that our prison sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That the present is broken. And as we go through this whole passage of Scripture, we'll see that in verse 20 it says, you can find that in creation. Bob preached about creation and the beauty of creation and all of that, but it says that if you just look at creation, you can see, and it says, for the creation was subjected to frustration. This word frustration, futility in, in some versions of the Bible, it, it means meaninglessness. It's just meaningless. And it's subjected to this, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. And we go back to Genesis 3, and then we see what happens after Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And God says, as a result of what you've done, you have caused this fracture called sin to enter the world. Now everything's off. 
But it says that God did that in hope. How we can look at the brokenness around us, but we can look forward to another day when everything will be okay. And you just look at creation and you see this. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage. Verse 21. From its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom of and glory of the children of God. We see all the time. Here's the groans of creation are all around us. When we see a, a hurricane headed toward Florida or, or the damage that it's caused, or we see that creation is groaning, frustration. When we find, when we find a, a, a tsunami hits, we say creation is groaning, frustration, it's broken. When we find that in creation, we see so, when it snows, for me, like creation is broken, <laughs> it's subject to frustration. That was not God's perfect plan. Shoveling snow was not part of God's perfect plan. <laughs> Wasn't in the plan. And so I don't have to look far. And I, I, I don't know, any parents here, any parents of, of children under the age of seven, I don't know, maybe it could be eight. I just go with how old my kids are at one year. And I, I project maybe another year of this. But uh, any, <laughs> any parents of children under the age of seven in here, right? I have two, okay? So here's what I'm going to say. Brokenness, where it exists in its fullness is uh, the back seat of my car, okay? <laughs> back seat of my car. Sometimes I get this, this, this Holy Spirit-driven unction to go to the car wash, and I go, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to do something today that's going to change my life. Wash my car, go put four quarters into that machine, get the vacuum, 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 and I'm like, oh my, this is clean. Look at this. It's beautiful. Restored the brokenness. Look at that. And I drive home, and I think the message that I'm passing to my kids is look at what I have done for you. It is clean, it is beautiful, and, 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 and I think that they're getting the message that let's keep this up, let's keep this place clean and beautiful, but what they're saying is, oh, it's clean, challenge accepted. I don't know how, how it works, but as, as I go through this church and, and I drive, and I could say, no, no Cheetos in the car, I will not buy Cheetos, and as soon as one falls to the ground, it multiplies like gremlins. I'm like, I'm, I am, I'm so convinced that Cheetos reproduce. They absolutely <laughs> mate. Because I'm like, this is not even a bag of Cheetos. <laughs> and, my, and Cheerios. Oh, anything that starts with a ch. <laughs> French fries. I mean, there's a French fry that's nine years old. I vacuumed. I'm like, where did you get it? But it's broken. And after a week, seven days, the backseat of the car is back to being broken. And that's what it's saying. The Bible's saying, listen, the efforts that we make, because you know what? We are going to restore and something else is going to break again. On this earth, we're going to continue to pour in our lives to push back the things that are dark, that are broken, and it's just going to keep on being a cycle. Now, hear, hear me out. I still vacuum the back seat of my car, even though I know it will re be restored to it, because I've seen the back seat of a car of people who have kids in college. There will be a day. That is the hope. <laughs> Someday I will no longer have to do this. And the hope as well is we continue to vacuum the brokenness of this world, but our hope cannot be in that we are going to restore it. We are going to go on mission trip after mission trip, and every year you will find new brokenness. You will go and you will serve people on the streets, and you will get them off of the streets, and you will still find that they will go back to the streets. It says, listen, keep trying, keep on trusting God, keep going where, where he sends you, but if your hope is in that you are going to restore the brokenness from Genesis 3, keep trying. That's not where our hope is, because the present is broken. The present is broken. And it's not about not doing it, but church, it's about where is our hope? Where is our hope fixed? And then we find in verse 23, it says, it's not just in creation, but this is also found in you. It says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, what a day. Can you imagine? Like, we see it in ourselves. And, and you know what? I, I think of this all the time. When, when I go through, if I, if I went through 
if I went through a, a maternity ward blindfolded I, and I didn't know where I was, I would think that this is a place where, where, there's, where there's just horror. But this is actually a place, those groans, those, those painful shouts. And I've been in that, I've been in that room. I, I know what that feels like. I see, I, you know, I was like, mm -mm, this is above my pay. I can't, this is something I can't handle. <laughs> but then when new life comes forth, and that is, those are the, it says here, the pains of childbirth, those groans. They're giving birth to something, a hope that is greater than the hope that we have, that, 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 that of, of us being able to restore this. But we find that even in ourselves, the hardest thing that we can face, the, the most difficult truth that we can come face to face with is this church, that from the day that you are born, there is something coming at you at 100 miles an hour every day, and that is death. And the news in this room that we might be avoiding is that each and every one of us is going to be gone someday. You could eat as much kale as you want. You could go on that treadmill. You could do all the right things. You could avoid 611 all you want and think, okay, that's going to probably add a few more days to my life. And you go, but we're all headed to the same place. And there's no way to know. It's the thing about being in ministry. There is no way to know who's heading when and what time. But you know what, church? The reality is this, that we're all headed for that one place. I know the baby is crying. It's like, come on, that's too soon for me. <laughs> it's like, yeah, now you're good. You got years. But the reality is that we see this brokenness. See, here's the thing, church. If our hope is fixed on Jesus just fixing our life here, and that is, that is how we can come to the conclusion that, oh, man, I think Jesus has failed me. Because the gospel has got to be good news to the person who's suffering, and it's got to be good news to the person who's not suffering. And the gospel's got to be good news to the CEO living in the mansion, and it's also got to be good news to the kid who's living on the streets. The gospel's got to be good news because the hope has to be fixed in something greater than just alleviating your suffering on this earth. And I'm not trying to minimize suffering, church. We have, a, we have a savior and a high priest that empathizes with everything that we go through, who doesn't go, come on, I purchased eternal life. Just suck it up and go through it. No, he weeps with us. But he says, your hope is not in restoring the things on this earth. And this is what I can say to you. And the encouragement is that we can look through the Bible and we can see that on the cross, Jesus, by his stripes, were healed. But on the cross, he purchased a healing that is greater than healing that we'll experience here on this earth. That some of us, yes, will experience healing and we'll pray and we'll keep on vacuuming the back seats. And some will experience healing. And some will not. Some will be made well again and some will die. But the reality is in Christ, the ultimate healing that he's brought us is that we will all be together forever. In Christ. That Jesus on the cross, the perfect example on the cross, there were two criminals on the cross. And the criminal to the right says, starts to hurl insults at Jesus saying, aren't you the Christ? If you are, why don't you save yourself and us? Just throws himself in there. Says, alleviate our suffering right now. Save us from this cross. If you are Jesus, if you're truly the Christ, do that. And then the thief on the other side starts to rebuke the other criminal and says, hey, listen, we are here because we deserve it. We are criminals. We are paying the price. This is the consequence of our sin, our brokenness. But this man is innocent. This is God. And he doesn't ask Jesus to take him down from the cross like the other thief. What does he say? Remember me when you enter your kingdom. He goes, I want to be in the place that you're going to. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. He says, right now on this cross, in, through this pain, through this, through this hurt that I'm going through, I am swiping the, the credit card of grace for you to have eternal life. More than this world. And church, when we, when we are confronted with the inevitable suffering, as Isaiah 43 says, when we go through the fire. 
And the promise is not if, but when we do, each and every one of us, that our hope will be fixed on something greater than this life. This life. Because the future, church, the future is glorious. The word that Paul uses all over this is, 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 is glory. In verse 17, before this, he talks about us being co-heirs with Christ, and he says, if indeed we share in his sufferings, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Glory. You know what, the Bible points us to heaven, that we have this heavenly trajectory, and you know what, we don't talk about heaven enough, right? We don't. We talk about this earth a lot, but we don't talk about where we are going enough. I, I remember the first, one of the first times someone was talking to me about heaven. I was just thinking to myself, Jesus, you need a new PR heaven guy on earth because this guy didn't do a good job. But they, the way they describe heaven was like, oh, you know, like in Isaiah 6, you know, the, the angels just sing, holy, holy, holy is, a, is the Lord God Almighty all day. I'm like, okay. There's one jam in heaven, one song. Okay, a <laughs> little bit repetitive. So, okay, that's one thing. And then he, say, and he started saying, hey, and you know, and the, and the wolf will lie next to the lamb and nothing will happen to the lamb. And I'm like, okay, I'm thinking about this. Like, the streets are paved with gold. And, 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 and he says, and, and so it's, 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 it's glorious. And then he says, and there'll be no marriage in heaven. And all I could think was, okay, so heaven, and it was just after a long, boring church service. Now we can be honest in church. Some church services are boring. And it was after one of those, I walk out and it's like, this is how someone described heaven. I was like, heaven is a boring, long church service, okay, with streets that are incredibly uncomfortable and hot because gold actually conducts heat really well and it's hard so it's not cushy. And the next thing, everyone's a vegan because wolves and lambs, if the lamb's not running, who's eating meat? If a wolf's not, and then I'm like, and there's no sex, marriage. <laughs> it's out. I'm like, I don't want that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait as long as I can before I sign up for that one. <laughs> can I try a free trial? Come on. Because the reality is that heaven didn't seem that amazing. Has this package wrong? But you know, then I look at God's word and, and, and our perspective of heaven has got to change and we have to see it from a different perspective. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, it says this, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. This means that the God who created everything you love, everything you love on this earth, if you've ever bit into a steak and you've put that in your mouth, and you've been like, I cannot imagine how someone cooked this so perfectly, or, or Brussels sprouts if you're a vegan. Like, it's like, oh, I cannot imagine how this was done. Or the first time you, you went to Disneyland, if you've been to Disneyland, it's like crazy. You're like, who, who came up with this? This is amazing. And the first time you felt the emotion of love, have you fell in love? Have you ever seen teenagers that think that they're in love? They're going crazy. They're like, I do. How is this even possible? Ah! <laughs> and the reality is that you're like, you've unlocked this thing that has been created by a creator who knew you, who knew your exact specifications, and you're feeling it for the first time, and you're blown away. And that God who created all those things says, you haven't even imagined how awesome heaven is. You can't even get it through your brain. You, you have never seen anything like it, never heard anything like it, and you have never tasted anything like it. It is amazing. And we find in Revelation 21, it says this, verse 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. You know what? No matter how good you have it today, church, there's not one of us in this room that is not at the mercy of one phone call messing up your life. One phone call. We all have that one phone call that if we received it, it would completely change the rest of our lives. And, and it says that that doesn't exist in heaven. It means that you can, you can never be told 
hey, we're laying you off. And, and feel the stress of how am I going to get by? You can never be told, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, sir, uh, you've lost a child. You can never hear that, hey, listen, we found something and, and there's no way to cure it. That, that news cannot come. There are no tears. There's no disappointment, no jealousy, no envy, no death. No, n- none of that. And you give me a nine-hour, 24-hour worship service with one song. If it's missing, if, if I can have peace in my heart, thank you. I'll take it. That's heaven. <coughs> Amen. And says that is what it's like. We can't even fathom how amazing it is. And so we see here that for us, as we go through sufferings, which are inevitable, which will come, and I'm not minimizing it, the gospel's got to be good because the gospel did something more than just make this life cushy and comfortable. But it, it pierced that. It went past that and said, here you go. You get forever. You get forever. C.S. Lewis says this. If you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. As Christians, we think about this world so much. Like I I took a screenshot as I Googled, what does the Bible say about? And and I took a a picture on my my computer with the results. And and this is, can you put that picture up? And this is what kind of came up as I looked at that. Uh, Like, Google was trying to finish the sentence for me. And all of that was just our focus on the things of this world. None of those things exist in heaven. None of them. So when we want to know what the Bible says, we want to know what the Bible says about now. Very few people want to know what the Bible says about where we're going. We want to know what the Bible says about how we're going to spend maybe 80, some of us 90. Maybe you really kill it no pun intended, and you go to 101. (laughs) Still, we just want to know how to protect this. Now, last night, I I pulled an illustration, and uh, before I even, everyone, when they saw the rope, they were like, oh, the rope, I've seen that before. Anyone who's been to youth group was just like, hey, check this out. But I remember seeing this illustration, and it just made such an impact in my life. I remember the pastor pulled out a a piece of rope quite like this, and and it was red, just like this, and he said, hey, listen, See this red part? This is your life here on earth. This red part. Some get nine, some get 24, some get 30, some get 90. Some get three weeks. But this is the red, your life here on earth. And in this, Jesus did a lot of things and can do a lot of things in your life. But the one thing that he wants to do the most is that you, in this red part, Submit to him, whether you're suffering, whether you're going through difficulties, that you submit and surrender your life to him and you say, I want to live a life that brings you glory in this red part. And some of us live a life that's just focused on just the red, but eternity is the rest of this rope. What Jesus has ultimately purchased for us on the cross and invites us into is the white part of this. And this rope goes on and on, church. I could, I could literally keep pulling this. I hope it's not attached to a sprinkler. But, uh, <laughs> but I could keep pulling this. Keep pulling this rope, church. And that's the rest of our lives. That's eternity. And we're living for the red. And Jesus says, what you do in the red affects how you're going to spend the rest of eternity. What your friends do in the red affects how they spend eternity. What your family do in the red affects how they're going to spend eternity. And church, we are here and we have this time to tell people about Jesus. We have this time to give him glory. We have this time to say, Lord, I want to live for so much more than just the red. But I want to be in the white with all the people that don't know you. I want to spend the white with all the people that, are, that, that haven't heard about you. I want to spend the white with all those people that, 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 that are suffering, that, that will never hear the gospel. Here's how, here's how we do it. We live in the red as though we are going to continue living in the white. And that changes how we live. It changes how we suffer, church. Because we go through stuff and we know that this is not it. You live as people who know that this is not it. You know what, I was contemplating this week 
uh, a few days ago, I saw a video that, that perfectly illustrated this, and, and, and I'll, and I'll kind of just set it up like this and, and share this, that in this video, I saw two things. I saw a person in the video who went through intense suffering, went through a difficult thing in their life, and I saw them in that suffering, in the midst of that suffering, point the person who inflicted the suffering on them to the white, to eternity, to that this life is, is, is small, but there is more. And can, we, can, we, can we play that clip real quick? I don't want to say twice or for the hundredth time what you've or how much you've taken from us. I think you know that. But I just... I hope you go to God with all what, all the guilt, all the thing, the bad things you may have done in the past. Each and every one of us may have done something that we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you, and. I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not gonna say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. You know what, church, this is the, like my third time watching that video. I'll tell you that. The picture that we see in that is a heart that is reconciled to Christ, wants others to know that same Christ that they know. That a heart that is reconciled with Christ can see through the red part of this life, our pain and suffering, can see through the difficulties. And as, and as followers of Jesus Christ, like this passage says, a creation eagerly awaits for the, res- the revealing of the sons of God. That the world is waiting for something that it cannot deny that is supernatural. And trust that Satan will do whatever he wants with this video and make it divisive. And do- but as Christians, we know that the picture that we see is that each and every one of us are that blonde police officer who is guilty. And that Jesus said, hey, listen, you inflicted the suffering on me, 
Yet I want the best for you. I don't even want you to pay a day for your penalty. Can I embrace you? What we see in that church is this. God does not waste our suffering. And when we have the right perspective, when we have an eternal perspective, we can see even in the midst of the deepest, darkest, most impossible, gut-wrenching pain, we can still have the, the love in our hearts to point people to the one who saved our souls. Now this morning, I want to pray. Because I know that there are people who are going through difficult things in this room. And maybe you've thought that your suffering was a cause, that it was caused by you being far from God. Maybe you thought that God was punishing you. Maybe you thought that God was just leaving you alone. I want to encourage you that he sees you, he knows you. That he loves you, that he wants the best for you. And he did that by making a way for you to be with him forever. And then for some of us in this room, maybe there are people who have caused suffering in our lives. I know it varies. I know it goes from small to devastating. But your suffering is your suffering. My prayer this morning is that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, do not, do not hold on to that bitterness and resentment for one minute longer. And that we find it in ourselves to say, Jesus, not in my own strength, but your strength, help me to say this. I want you to, to know Jesus Christ to the people who have caused suffering in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for who you are. Lord, you are good. Even when it doesn't feel like it, even when it's hard to say it, Lord, we want to say that you are good. We know that you are. My prayer is this morning for each and every one of us, my, myself, Lord, my hand up's first. I said, Lord, that you, you would remind me of the great price that you paid for my freedom. And Lord, that I wouldn't live a life, Lord, that's just fixed on this world and, and, and the brokenness in this world, but Lord, that I would, I would fix my eyes on the things above. Help me, Lord, to fix my heart. Help us to fix our heart on heavenly things where you are seated, Jesus. Not at things on this earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.